Good evening. Welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, businesswoman and board member of the Reserve Bank, Heather Ridout. The Minister for Employment and Government Leader in the Senate, Erica Betts. Oil rig engineer and founder of Youth Without Borders, Yasmin, Yasmin Abdel-Majid. University of Queensland Law Professor, James Allen. And the Shadow Minister for Finance, Tony Burke. Please welcome our panel. Thank you, and as usual, we're being simulcast on ABC News 24 at News Radio, and you can join the Twitter conversation or send us a question by using the Quanda hashtag that just appeared on your screen. Well, our first question tonight comes from Amanda Keogh. The renewable energy target has been described as Australia's largest and most successful carbon abatement policy, one that could significantly assist the government in meeting its 5% emissions reduction target by 2020. The Abbott government's planned review this year of the renewable energy target is fanning speculation that the RET, which mandates that 20% of all electricity come from renewable sources by 2020, could be revised down or even scrapped altogether. Bloomberg analysts have said that if the renewable energy target is abolished, investment in large-scale renewables would cease and the majority of companies concerned with that would close. My question is whether the government is willing to prepare, is willing to take that risk. Eric Abetz. The renewable energy target is one that was set and the review that is about to take place was in fact set in the legislation. So with respect, it's not the Abbott government's review. It was a review that was going to take place at all times. And I think it makes good sense for us as a nation to wait to see what the review reveals rather than predetermine our position before the review even commences. So Greg, uh, Greg Hunt, your minister, predetermined your position before the election by saying the coalition is committed to the renewable energy target knowing it's been the driver of investment in renewables. Is that commitment still solid, do you think? Our commitment is to renewable energy, but uh, we are having this review, we are committed to the review, and uh, Greg Hunt's comments should be seen in that context. But what we have had is a set figure which was <coughs> determined to be 20%. And on that basis, certain uh, computer modelling, etc., was done. It's now pretty clear that that 20% target is in fact about 27 plus percent, and therefore it's gone beyond that which was anticipated, having consequences on the economy. All those things should be and need to be explored by the review and we shouldn't seek to prejudge it or predetermine right, I'll move on to our position. other panellists in a moment. Yeah. The Chamber of Commerce said tonight the RET is corporate welfare on a massive scale. Is that an exaggeration? Look, uh, I haven't seen their comments. Uh, I don't want to uh, be a commentator on uh, this issue. It just seems to me that uh, given that we were to have a review uh, predetermined uh, that there would be a review this year that we should have that review, let everybody have their input into it and see what the review determines. Heather Ridder. Well, I think the Minister's quite right. Um, the RET is actually producing a, a target of around 27% now compared to what was originally anticipated. The target actually was at least 20%. It wasn't just 20%. And I think that's something that, in my role on the Climate Change Authority, I, I had to learn about as well. Um, it is very expensive, the renewable energy target, a very expensive abatement method, and, and I think we've seen that with solar and, and various other things. At the same time, I think it's really important that Australia, which has encouraged many companies to invest in this area, um, for those investments to be able to work their way through the system. Otherwise, there is issues around sovereign risk of companies having invested in this country in major renewable energy infrastructure, whether it's wind or whatever. You should also realise that on many days, the only um, energy going to the grid in the whole of South Australia is renewable. So it is quite exciting that we've started to make some of these transitions in terms of our energy usage. Um, the Climate Change Authority had a, a review, you're quite right, Minister, another review was mandated. Uh, that review, though, was very robust and did talk to an awful lot of people in the community and in business about it. Let's so. see from Tony Burke. It was, uh, wasn't your government that brought it in, actually. It was John Howard originally, but you did increase it. Increase it, that's right, to the 20%. <coughs> what Eric's just said is a mile away from what was said before the election. 
Yeah, to be saying now, oh, look, we're not going to prejudge the review. Before the election, we were told, carbon price, you disagreed with us. Renewable energy target, you're exactly in line and fully supportive of it. Now, all of a sudden, it's let's not prejudge the review. I know renewable energy is expensive. So is unlimited pollution. It's expensive too. And to, I mean, I'm trying to fathom if there's any environmental decision that this government won't go against. Should we have a review or not? Yeah, of course you have a review. Uh, right. The review is statutory. But we'll but prejudge say, it. But, but we'll prejudge say, it. Uh, Eric, Eric, <laughs> when reviews are held all the time, governments say, we're having a review, but the review will be into the process. The review will be into certain things. Not the review will be into whether or not we should have made an election commitment that we told the people we'd follow through on. You and should, that's what you've just remodelled today. You us. should be honest and say you'd save the taxpayer the money of having the review. The review shouldn't be the end process in itself. And I think I, that's something I get frustrated about. It's that whenever there's something that people are particularly passionate about or want to see the result of, OK, we'll do a review in it. And, and that's kind of about the government, whoever's in government's way of saying, well, you know, we're showing that we're interested, but we're not actually going to do anything about it. I think it's important that we look at how Australia can have a combination of different energy sources, because I think energy, energy is the challenge of our generation. And so there isn't going to be one answer for everything. This is coming from an oil industry worker. I know, I know. And it's, <laughs> it's a little bit ironic. How popular will you be on the oil rigs? Not, well, I mean, I couldn't really go work in manufacturing, could I? Uh, no, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> Can I say something? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. So I think I disagree with everybody here. I'm a real skeptic about this. When you see what's happening in the UK with renewable energy prices exploding, look, if you're worried about carbon dioxide, Go nuclear. I come from Toronto. There's a huge nuclear plant two minutes from Toronto. France gets 60% of its electricity from nuclear. The only plausible answer is nuclear power. This, you know, playing around at the margins with a bit of solar power. And it's not just, it's not just corporate welfare. It's middle class welfare. Nice rich people who can afford the massively subsidized solar panels on their house are taking money away from companies, they're taking the money away from working class people so that middle class people can feel good about themselves. If you're worried about it, you should go nuclear. That's what I would do. So this is all at the margin. Just step one, one early on. You, you, mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the solar question. Of course, five million uh, people have put solar panels on their roofs. So it's probably a bit beyond uh, just the Possibly my neighbours get it and they people. get, you know, almost, they pay almost no electricity costs and, you know, they're driving... Uh, Audis and BMWs, a great, it's a great way to run your economy, you know, it's fantastic. What do you but, drive? But, but if you could, if you could actually... <laughs> I drive a car. Yeah. If you, if Australian you could, made? If you could, uh, no, actually not, no. as a matter of fact. If you could um, reduce your energy costs by putting solar panels on your roof, doesn't that make sense? Well, because, I mean, the what, what we're being told is the renewable energy target has caused <clears throat> electricity prices to go through the roof. But in fact, what you just said is the opposite. No, what I said is it's not just corporate welfare. For the few select people who opt in to get solar panels at a highly subsidised rate, of course it's good for them. Um, but it doesn't mean it's good for Australia. It doesn't mean it's good for the taxpayer. It means it's good for people in nice neighbourhoods who can afford to put solar panels on. Of course they should do it. I, Tony, oh, okay, go ahead, just go ahead. I think that's actually a good point, and it's about energy access. Did everybody for, hear that? Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to happen often. <laughs> <laughs> Never hear that at home. So. Um, the idea of energy access for the poor, because we're all happy sort of saying, OK, we're going to go to renewable or whatever it may be and, and, and try to live a better life, but... There are so many people, not only just in Australia, but globally, who don't have access to energy. There's something like 2.7 billion people in the world who don't have any access to energy. So how can we, and I think this is a really important global discussion that we have to have, how can we talk about reducing um, emissions and, and, and looking at how, um, you know, w forcing everyone else, I suppose, generally, to look at more expensive forms of energy, but at the same time say, well, we don't want you to develop just as fast, or we want you to reduce your rate of development because we already used up all the quotas. OK, but at the moment we're talking about what's going on in Australia specifically. Tony Burke, I just want to ask you this. Is the opposition opposed to this review because Dick Warburton is chairing it? Well, the, what we're opposed to is the government not keeping a commitment that they made before the election. And before so you've the got election, no objections, just, just to confirm, no, no, the, you have no objections to Dick Warburton. The review was the, part of the election promise. Yeah, but within right. the context that you'd support a renewable energy target. And you mm. won't say on this panel tonight that you support keeping the renewable energy target. What I will say is... <laughs> uh, 
What is the target? 20%, 27%, is it a fixed figure? The target's at least 20. Mm -hmm. oh, at least 20. Mm -hmm. There we go, so not fixed. Mm -hmm. Not fixed in your mind. So uh, what would it do to the economy if it went to 30? Or back to 20, which is where you think it should be, is that correct? Well, where is the Labor Party position on this? What we get from Tony but actually, Blair no, but right at and the, the moment, Labor Party... I think you've is, forgotten you're, you're that you're not in, in government. Opposition. You're actually in government. Now, so. <laughs> The, the important decisions will be made Tony. by the government. Be assured, Tony, I have not forgotten that the people of Australia endorsed us mm. to form the government <laughs> of this country. But what I do get sick and tired of is Tony Burke saying, oh, wow, no, was... <laughs> saying no to absolutely everything we as a government put forward. Be it on the carbon tax be it on the mining tax, trying to get Australia back on track. Yep. And when you have a review that was mandated, everybody knew about, agreed to well before the election, to say that we are going to follow through on that review and then be accused of breaking your election promise because you are going to have that review, I just find puzzling strange. I'll be unbelievably quick, but just, a, a, just to quickly analyse the bit about us saying no to everything, pot kettle black. Please. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Uh, let, you're, you're going to change. We did, not, we did not promise no carbon tax. Okay, so the steady election. on. We actually have a question on that subject. And the next question comes from Jenny Shepherdson. It was predicted prior to the introduction of the carbon tax that the coal industry in Australia would lose jobs to overseas competitors and mines would be closed. In the Upper Hunter Valley Basin alone, between 1,500 to 2,000 miners and contractors lost their jobs after the scheme was introduced. Such a large number of layoffs has an ongoing effect on the community in all business sectors, and it is the belief of many business owners in the Hunter Valley that the government's proposal to abolish the carbon tax should go ahead. Why would the Labor Party and the Greens proposed to vote against this when the carbon tax has caused so, so much unemployment and created its own financial crisis. Tony Burke. We believe that we need to take serious action on pollution. We don't believe pollution should be unlimited. I don't accept for all the different things that have happened with the, with the dollar and the markets that the carbon price can have the full extent of what's just been levelled at it levelled. Uh, but ultimately, we go into the parliament and we vote the way we believe is the most responsible decision for Australia. And we have always, always supported, and there's been different models, different mechanisms, but a price on carbon and a limit on pollution, a limit on pollution levels, as opposed to unlimited pollution levels, is something that we've always supported. So we vote that two way. Things? You go ahead. So for, firstly, on the actual carbon tax, it does nothing, right? In 22 million people in Australia, um, it has changed the rate of increase of the world's temperature at 0, 0.00, stop me, and then say one at some point in time tomorrow. Um, it does nothing. So it's moral exhibitionism. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's just a bunch of people trying to feel good about themselves. As I said, if you care, they're building a new power plant in China every week. I've just come back from and a year in North carbon. America. And, you know, they don't even know that it's happening in Australia. The second thing on the politics. Um, Abbott has a, has a mandate on this, it's clear. And the new Senate will put it through. And the problem for Bill Shorten is going to be that for two years after the carbon tax goes, the coalition will be running ads saying, are you going to bring it back? And you'll get a, they'll get annihilated at the election if they go into the next election saying they're going to bring the carbon tax back. Tony knows it, I know it, everyone knows it. They can't do that. So they're going to be in this position of saying a, a year from now, we won't bring it back. And it's going to look you know, dishonest. Well, let's just quickly go back to Tony Burke on that. Um, you, you basically are operating as a, on a matter of principle at this point because you know, I think, uh, that come July when the Senate changes, then you'll lose that battle. Um, so you're just holding the line for a few months. Is that worth it as a matter of principle, considering the damage you might do to yourself politically? I, I, belie I believe it is. And will I, you believe it, I believe it is absolutely important to have 
limits on pollution. Will you it bring is the, the tax it is back the after July 1st? I'm not going to tonight start to say no, in see, two and a half years' time... I was supposed to. I was supposed to. But look, if I might quickly say, Tony, with great respect, this is not a matter of principle. As a matter of principle, in 2010, you promised the Australian people there will be no carbon tax. You then went to the last election, 2013, Kevin Rudd saying, we've abolished the carbon tax, and your candidates were going around saying, we will abolish the carbon tax. We are now in government wanting to abolish it, and now it's a matter of principle to break your election promise, not once, but twice. Um, can, I just make, can I just make the point about politics? Um, Greg Hunt made a very strong commitment to continuing with the renewable energy target. So we now wait and see whether that happens. I that's suppose. right, that's right. Yeah. Wait and see, right. and don't prejudge it. All right, let's hear from the other panellists on this question of the carbon tax and its impact. Well, Heather Riddart, you supported the well, um, carbon pricing well, carbon mechanism. Carbon price, I supported. I mean, I think it's stretching the long bow to blame the introduction of carbon pricing for the, the closure of the coal mines in the Hunter Valley. I think that's much to do with, well, coal prices. It'll be... It, um, in, uh, these issues might be important, but then it's not the major reason, in my view. Um, and in relation to both, both parties agree, that, agree with the science and they all believe that humans are contributing to global warming. That's an agreement between both sides of politics. You've both signed off on the same targets, 5% below on 2000 levels, by the same date. So we, we, we're having this debate, we should be having a debate about what is the least cost way we can achieve abatement in Australia. Now, I'm an economist by background, so I think put a price on it. That's the best way to go. Where I disagreed with Tony and his colleagues was that we had to wait so many years to get the price. The original one was have a $10 price for 12 months, yeah. that was the original scheme, and off we go, put a market price on it, which would have been very so, low now. Heather, do you think Six that Australia should be leading the world? Hey, can, can I say should to be you, leading all the other can I say developed countries? We've grown for 22 years mm -hmm. in a row, and the last 12 months is the first time we've grown at the same time we reduced our emissions. Very important. And the, en the emissions intensity of the Australian economy has halved over the last the decade. The US has now, reduced I've, emissions massively well, by moving to fracking yeah, but, and the well, natural gas. Well, we've had to gas. do it another way. But we are making progress. And I'm not saying the carbon price is, is the main, as I say about the coal <coughs> price, it's not the main issue, but it has been a contributor. What we have to do, if, we, if the science is right, and we all agree the science is right, if we don't act now, we're going to have a much worse... Um, task in front of us. Mm -hmm. And I think That's with all of you young people in this room, it's such a very important issue that we understand. Listen. And John Perry, Christine Lagarde, and Dean Sainz. Yes, and once again, go ahead. That's the crux of the matter. I mean, the discussion is political. The discussion, you guys are making something that's about the future and our environment into yeah. something that's about politics. politics. And that's not, we, that's not what we want to hear. What we want to hear, I mean, John Kerry got up and said, climate change is the weapon of mass destruction. I mean, isn't that clear? And we were people, we were a country that... Yeah, he's a serious guy. I mean, yeah. yeah. And Christian Lagarde's a serious person. Exactly. And so, yeah, it's, so. A, it's, it's something that we need to tackle with the seriousness that it deserves. And I think reducing it to a, simply a policy discussion is disrespectful. Yes, and man, and life is about politics, politics when people disagree. Discussion. Well, this is true. And there's no way you can pretend that we're all going to be in a Coke commercial holding hands and singing. People <laughs> disagree. <laughs> and when you disagree, you have politics. And politics is a good thing. And so to say that it's just about politics misses the point. It's good that it, people disagree and you have to discuss it and you, and you end up having to vote. It's the only way to resolve disagreement. Unless you believe in some world experts who sit on climate commissions or something deciding all these things, which is a bad thing, you have to decide by politics. And I politics mean, is a good thing. Look, politics is a good thing, but not when it stops progress. So we just have an international elite or decide or that. You should go and move to Europe. But who and determines what think. progress is? Uh, I'm old-fashioned. Yeah. I believe in the ballot box and the say of the people. You're okay. old-fashioned. That's why you don't seem to think that climate change is something we should care about. No. I'm uh, sorry. I'm just going to... We, we've got a lot of subjects to talk about, and uh, I think we are sort of going backwards so. and forwards over that one. Our next question is from Sun Yong Kim. Since the last Labor government dismantled the Howard IR laws, there has emerged a mountain of evidence that Fair Work Australia is strangling the life out of business. According to the Australian Mining and Metals Association, 82.6% of their members have tried to negotiate productivity improvements in exchange for wage increases under the Fair Work Act and have not been able to do so. With unemployment rising and productivity in freefall, 
Do you really think we can wait until 2016 to address our increasingly inflexible labour markets? Let's start with James. Uh, OK, well, I guess I'd say three things. Uh, you know, I come from North America. I like the way you always tell us how many things you're going to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to make sure I get to say them. Um, <laughs> so in the entire rest of the developed world, as far as I know, you do not have a labor relations regime like Australia's. It's the most bizarre thing to come here and see it, to have these sort of administrative bodies that make awards as if some third party pseudo government person knows better than the two parties. You don't see it even in France or Scandinavia. It's completely bizarre. I don't really understand why anyone would think it's a good idea. Um, but if you're going to have that, there's a lot of blame to be cast here. The High Court of Australia should have struck down work choices. It was a terrible decision by our High Court. Uh, we would have gone back to the day before that. We would have had the states deciding it the way they should in this country. Um, but you do have this weird situation where, under these laws, a union for people working for the best company in the world, Toyota, can go to a judge, the same guy who decided the Andrew Bolt trial, by the way, um, and say to him, stop this company from talking to the workers, the people we're supposed to represent. Now, how that can be a good thing? You know, I don't think you need to have low wages. To have, you know, Germany pays an awful lot of money, more than we do. But the German unions, you know, Volkswagen's in bed with IG Metal. They are incredibly flexible. When things aren't going well in Germany, the unions take pay cuts. They don't have sick days. They don't take Fridays off. Um, and they certainly bargain with the uh, companies there. We have a real problem when unions who didn't have to do this go to a judge and ask the judge to stop Toyota from even talking to their own members. In that sense, it's hardly surprising that Toyota leaves. Now, I know Toyota said it had nothing to do with that, but look, they want to sell cars, okay, right? I think, I think that's at least three things. Yeah. Tony Burke. <laughs> Um, well, secondly, given the final sentence was, I know Toyota said it had nothing to do with that. I think that actually counts for something. But they want to sell uh, cars. They've the, got to say that when they leave. The, you know, they want to keep selling. But the other point, when right at the beginning, James, you began with the comparison with North America. Australia is not a country where you need to give someone a tip before they actually reach a minimum wage. I'm from Canada. In Canada, it's more social democratic than Australia. I should have said how many numbers I was going to yeah, okay. talk to at the beginning. <laughs> uh, we have a system here in Australia where the principle of someone being paid fairly is a cornerstone principle. I actually think that's a good thing. I actually think that matters. And on the occasion that the other side of politics decided to turn that on its head and get rid of the no disadvantage test, the Australian people spoke very loudly on that occasion too. Eric Abetz, so yes. uh, address the question if you yeah. would. The, the question, uh, the questioner asked, um, can uh, the businesses that he's talking about wait until 2016? Because essentially, you've said no serious change to industrial relations until then. If you I take can, it to an election. Can I correct the questioner and yourself, Tony, in relation to that? We announced a 38-page policy before the election. Part of that was that good faith bargaining would actually require the company and the unions to actually discuss issues of productivity uh, before protected action ballots uh, could take place. So we believe that productivity is vital. We did include that in our policy and we look forward to Labor's support uh, in getting that through the Parliament uh, uh, very shortly. Can, can, can I ask you some detail on that? Yeah. Because you've also commissioned a review of penalty rates. And uh, if that no. review... Well, you have effectively. No. Does Fair Work Australia to look at penalty rates? Or the Fair Work Commission... Fair Work when Commission, it was, I should yeah, say, yes. Yeah, when it was set up... Um, under Labor and the Modern Awards, there was to be a four-year review of the Modern Awards. Mm. That is coming up this okay. year. Yeah. So that is part of that ongoing mechanism, part of that ongoing review. But and if, penalty if the, if rates the review, will be considered. If, if that's right. If the review tells you that serious reform is required of penalty rates, for example, would you do it in this term? Well, it wouldn't be up to us. It would be up to the Fair Work Commission as the independent umpire to make that determination. And I have said that time and time again, that we as a parliament don't want to be in the business of legislating wages, penalty rates, when you take lunchtime, morning tea, afternoon tea. We have an independent umpire to do that. And everybody with a view on this should be putting their submission to the Fair Work Commission for them then to make the determination in relation to the issue of penalty All right, let's rates. go back to the question. Are you happy with what you have heard here that an independent umpire is going to be making judgments on this? Yeah. 
You are. OK. Heather Ritter. I think, um, I mean, Why? what we're talking about <laughs> here is... <laughs> is, it, is we'll come back to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm um, sure you've got more than that If to you say. look at what's gone on, on in Australia over the last eight or nine years, we've had the biggest resources boom since the gold rush. Huge. And everybody was worried um, that we we're going to have a big wages breakout. Right? We're going to have a big wages explosion, the economy blow up, interest rates that go through the roof. You know, the, the pattern of Australian history. It didn't happen. In fact, wages were quite restrained all through that period. Those and are good no, no, I've gone for them. I'm coming to you. Yeah, well, I think we'd, we'd done a lot of reforms to the system yeah. and the, the new award system, which was sort of being worked through, a lot, a lot of things changed and our system actually absorbed huge pressure where people like you guys were getting massive amounts working on oil rigs off, in offshore places and people working in manufacturing industry that couldn't afford to give these sorts of wage increases were getting much lower wage increases. So our system worked much better in terms of the macroeconomic outcomes. What happened though was when the, the Labor Party did make very, very restrictive changes to the Fair Work Act, which in my old job I railed against. Tony knows that, but they introduced a lot of inflexibility into the system. So it was harder to absorb a lot of the changes that occurred in the economy. And they're the sorts of things that need to be changed. And I think this, this penalty rate issue, this is really as much an outcome of what we did. We crunched 4,000 awards into 122. And when you do that, you kind of level up a whole lot of stuff and it didn't work for a lot of small businesses. So would you, which are but now would you like on... to see the government step in and make some actual well, changes to legislation the, or is that not necessary? Because commission... a lot of people in business would like to well, see they should, serious and, reform. And, and people are very concerned about it. But I hope the Fair Work Commission mm. has the wit to be able to look at the facts and to be able to come up with some sensible outcomes. Mm. Um, and, and it should be able to, unless we get people um, in other places not are playing a, a constructive role in the process. Listen, but we do you, need right. to see um, a more flexible industrial mm. relations system. But I'm, I'm a great supporter. Australia has a wonderful safety net, whether it's mm. minimum wages, whether it's public health care and public education and paid parental aid. These are wonderful things. They're very much part of our system. They're not, they're not arcane or bizarre, mate. They're really good I things. I come from Canada. There's more safety really nets good. in Canada yeah, than yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. more safety nets yeah. in Canada than here. So the idea that, mm. you know, you're advocating um, some US system is ridiculous. I, the award system doesn't exist in a single other country. So mm. it's not the US I'm pointing to. Pick your favorite social democratic country. Sweden, mm. France, you know, pick one. Well, it I mean, but Germany has works councils and the yeah. employers would yeah. rail against that sort of stuff here, I can mm. tell you. Let me, uh, let me hear from Yasmin. Um, mm. What happened when this debate about penalty rates in particular got started is there was a huge amount of concern within the community from people who live from their penalty rates from week to week. They require it to pay their mortgages and their household income is, uh, requires it. What are your thoughts about that? Look, as someone who does shift work and, and the sort of work that, that you, I suppose, benefit, benefit from when it comes to penalty rates, I think it's something... I mean, I, I'm only, you know, a young graduate. I can't sort of speak about the technicalities and the history. But I, I think wages are reflective of the kind of cost of living um, pressures that we, that we sort of experience in society. And, look, there have been a huge number of changes to the IR laws in the last decade or so. And so it can't be easy for small business to sort of respond to that and to deal with it. But at the same time, I mean, I come from the perspective of a regular employee who simply just wants to live their life and be able to make enough money to make ends meet. And that's what should be looked at at the end of the day. Are our employees able to, to make ends meet? Are they able to live the kind of life that we want them to live in Australia? And from that, my perspective, look, just because other countries... But Yasmin, you're not really a regular employee. You're the top student at UQ in mechanical engineering. You got a job at Schlumberger and now you're working for Royal Dutch. That is not a regular... Company name. That is not oh a regular... <laughs> you, can't, no. you cannot sell yourself as a regular job. And you can't. congratulations cannot. for all She's of that. A um, <laughs> um, Tony, Tony Burke, um, just quickly to, to end this discussion, if the independent umpire comes down and says serious reform is needed, would Labor accept that? The, the independent umpire works within the statutory rules that it has. And, uh, and we, we establish the umpire, we support the umpire. Always have. So, so if, if, the, you, you, if the, so I'm saying if no, if, no, but you're talking about the umpire stepping outside its statutory rules yeah. and saying don't so, like so, the so rules. So you're saying it's not possible. I, for, I can't. Not I can't, possible I can't for the envisage. What, I can't envisage what you've just described. So the commission couldn't recommend reform of penalty rates, for example. Well, I, I can't envisage what you've just described. 
So, oh well, oh well, Tony, you know that the legislation does allow the Fair Work Commission to consider these matters and it's open to them to either increase or decrease penalty rates, determine when they start applying, when they don't apply. You know that Yeah, no, the, well. the question was about recommending changes to their own legislation within that inquiry that's currently underway. Well, no, I was actually no, talking about no. changes to conditions, really. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, they, they make those decisions yes. every day. Yeah. Yeah. We, yes. Yes. We yeah. If they change penalty rates when they apply and so on, the very things mm. uh, that Eric Metz is talking about, you would accept that, would you? Decisions made by the independent umpire we support. OK, let's move on. Our next question is for Eric Metz, and it's from Emily Holm. When you announced the Royal Commission into Trade Union Corruption, you said that it would be a sword that cuts both ways and that employers would also come under scrutiny. Why do the Royal Commission's terms of reference exclude, then, the two construction companies that have recently gone into liquidation owing millions to workers and who were also major contributors to the Liberal Party? Why have you tried to give the public the impression that the Royal Commission will focus on both union and employer wrongdoing when that is not the case? Can, can I correct, Emily? Yeah, the terms of reference are very clear. It will cut both ways. Uh, employers will clearly be uh, part and parcel of it. What we had uh, within the union movement, regrettably, is a sophisticated and systemic system of slush funds. And when you've got a former Labor Attorney General, such as Rob McClellan, saying a Royal Commission might be a good idea, uh, former AWU Secretary, now Commissioner Ian Cambridge, on the uh, Fair Work Commission saying it would be a good idea. If I might say, Tony, the exposés by ABC 730 and the Fairfax Media, and it's not often you would hear me say that they have done a great public service in this space, but they have, they have. The exposures are through a whole range of unions and what that exposure has shown is that what Ms Gillard said all those years ago, that every union has its slush fund, is unfortunately correct, and that is why unionists as diverse as Steve Pavanis and Cathy Jackson actually support this Royal Commission. Yeah, can I just, uh, just going back to uh, our question, though, I went and looked at the terms of reference, and there is specific reference to five unions, mm. but not to any construction business. There is an oblique reference to bribes or unlawful yeah. payments between union officials and other parties other parties. Presumably that's the reference to businesses, because there's only one oh, in the whole oh, terms of reference, oh, is that look, it? Uh, absolutely. Uh, as I said at the uh, media conference, there is no way you can have a corrupt union official without a business providing the house or the new roof or the car in the driveway. And that is what we will be in we, sorry, the Royal Commissioner, will be investigating. It is vitally important that that be done so. And might I add, so many genuine, honest trade union officials have said to me, Eric, this will make our task so much easier because we are in it to look after the workers, not to get endorsement for the Federal Parliament. And that's why we're not interested in slush funds. We're just interested in looking after the workers. So when you've got a situation, for example, Tony Sheldon, National Vice President of the ALP, admitting he used the money of Transport Workers Union membership fees to bankroll a health services union election without the knowledge of his membership, I think people have a right to ask questions. All right, I'll questions. Go, I'm actually, I probably, I was going to go to other panellists first, but I think Tony Burke needs to respond to that. With the allegations Eric's just made, I don't see why they don't get dealt with by the police. I don't see why they don't get dealt with by the Crime Commission that has all the powers of a Royal Commission. Mm. Uh, the, the political game in the way the government's handled this, I think, is pretty transparent. If you look at the powers of a Royal Commission, which once you set it up, you're saying you're spending a lot of money on it and you're saying we're highlighting this issue above all else. Now, the last Royal Commission that we set up was one into child abuse by institutions. I think of the, the Keating years where it was set up in a, the stolen generation. And I look into this government and I just see politics and games all over it. Oh. Interesting that you should raise the issue of child abuse. There are, in fact, laws 
against that in our country. Why was it necessary? Fully support, might I add, the Royal Commission. It was systemic, it was cultural, it was embedded, and it needed to be um, aerated. It needed the sun to shine on it. Similarly, regrettably, within the union movement, there is that same sort of systemic, sophisticated cover-up in a different arena, I fully accept. But they're the circumstances in which you have a Royal Commission and Deputy Commissioner of Police in Victoria acknowledged that there is a cultural situation with police and law enforcement agencies that basically says, oh, this has occurred in the industrial context, so we won't really investigate it as we should. You don't yeah, think the Crime Commission would investigate it? That, that well, was the Can I, can I just say, um, commissioner. You, you only really came up with the idea of the Crime Commission or indeed a police task force right at the very last minute when they called the Royal Commission. If you really thought a Crime Commission or, Royal, or Police Task Force was a good idea, why didn't Labor come up with this when in government? Well, <laughs> on allegation after allegation when it's been made, for a, we've always said it should be dealt with by the police. Always. Mm. And on this specifically. Mm. Uh, the issues of it should be dealt with by the police were being said by Brendan O'Connor a long time before. But it, took, it took the media to come out and expose these sort of things which were happening and yet at the highest levels of the mm. union movement it must have been known. No, whenever I've heard, I've, I've done it not on this program, on other programs over the years, whenever an allegation of this sort of nature is made, you say it should be dealt with by the police. That's, so that's so not your a, former a Attorney new... General Rob McClelland is wrong, Commissioner Cambridge is wrong, calling for a Royal Commission into these matters. Can I say to you, Tony, okay. with great respect, it's not our side of politics, it was your right. side I, of I'll politics, what, uh... disgusted with the goings on that have also called okay. for a Royal now, Commission. Okay, now a lot of people sent us questions in about jobs, and I want to move on mm. to that, and I'm sorry to the rest of the panellists if they might have want to get involved in that discussion, but jobs are very important. You're watching Q&A, where you can send your questions by text or video to the Q&A website. Our next question is a video. Hi, my name is Brett Meredith. I work in Europe for 21 years for an automotive car manufacturer. I'm highly trained by European and Japanese experts. I'm now back in Australia and I've been searching for a job. I have done 520 job applications and I'm still unemployed. My question to you is, how do you expect to reallocate the 7,000 odd workers from the closure of the Ford, Holden and Toyota plants. Thank you. OK, let's start not with the politicians but with Heather Ridder. Well, I think it won't be just 7,000. It'll be many other thousands of people who work for the components industry. I mean, I uh, was on the Holden Advisory Board for a number of years. I've been around this industry my entire working life and I never thought I'd see the day when we didn't make cars in Australia. And, and I'm not criticising the government's decision, I'm just saying it's just such a huge break from the past. Um, in the past when we Could it have been saved? I'm sure it could have been saved. How? I mean, well, anything can be saved in a certain way. But, I mean, in the end, the decision's been made. It's a bit like on the Royal Commission. There's no point but going no, there. No but neither can company I say came one? to us. Well, you know, but I think... So um, how much we, money per worker? Would you have thrown out these companies? Well, as much as the going? Americans do, for example, or the Germans. or But I'm, look, I'm not saying we should the have done The Productivity Commission said we throw more the, money at the car industry than anyone else. So if we threw with the Americans, if we threw with the Americans, then we wouldn't be throwing anything. Well, OK, let's... Anyway, right, now, we'll, we'll have to do it per car, I'm look, I, not per... I know a little yeah, bit we'll, about We'll come back to you. We'll hear... We'll come to you next. I want to hear from Heather I wasn't actually advocating... your thought. I wasn't advocating we should spend more money. I mean, both sides of politics have spent a lot of money on the car industry over the years. And, you know... So I think that's important. But the issue now is what sort of economy we're going to have. Now, the Australian dollar going up from 87 cents to $1.05 in about an eight-month period was a massive competitive shock to a lot of companies. And they haven't really recovered from it. And the car industry was caught up in all of that. And so our future's been fast-forwarded. We haven't been able to just logically make changes slowly or in a managed sort of way. So leadership from government is extremely important. And we really do need need to concentrate on a few things. We need to improve the investment environment in Australia because we need people investing here in non-mining companies and they're not. In investment in these industries is weak and we need to lift that because that'll be the source of the job for that guy. The other issue is we need to make sure we're not bringing in skilled migrants because the people who are let go 
from the car industry don't have the skills to be able to get jobs in the new industries that emerge when we create this terrific investment environment. So there's a whole retraining, um, lifting capability tasks required. But this won't happen in a minute and it's going to be quite a big task. We've got a couple of years before we stop making cars. If, if we're lucky. If because as you see, Ford is already reducing yeah, its workforce and can, if the market yeah. turns against Australian-made cars, there's nothing to keep them here. Well, I think that, you know, Australian-made cars are damn good cars and a lot of Australians yeah. drive them. And, you know, you, you mean, a lot of us I've drive... been here nine years yeah. and I've driven an Australian-made yeah. Ford Territory nine yeah. years. What about you, Heather? Well, I drove an Astra for... What do you drive, what do you drive right now? Oh, I drive... It's because, well, it, it, it matters. It ma well, right? it does, because it matters. It matters. Look, if you're going to start seeing that they it's such a good product that everyone should buy it. My son, who lives in Mongolia, sort of I drive his little broken down not. Golf, actually. Uh, so the head of go. Ford said yeah. it costs twice as much as Germany to make a but car. The big, issue, weird the big about that. issue, Tony, is that we need to create a new economy. And a lot of work's been done around the sorts of jobs we can create in Australia. And they're good jobs. They're good jobs. All service jobs aren't um, really low-grade jobs these days. They're, one of the most interesting things that happen in manufacturing, there are more service jobs in manufacturing these days than in making, the making bit. So it's all been transformed. But, you know, it's a challenge and it can be done, but we need to be very systematic about it and people need to be given confidence that we can make this big transition because we've had to make a lot of, take a lot okay. of shocks in a short period Let's hear from Yasmin who told us earlier she um, would have thought about going into the car industry if it was possible. Look, I mean, I loved motorsport, I loved cars and to be honest that was where I wanted to end up until a lot of, most of my mentors said to me the automotive industry is dead in Australia and so I had to look elsewhere and I actually want to say that all my opinions here are my personal opinions um, and not representing anybody else. Um, but I think what you're saying Heather is extremely important and that is that we need to have a vision for what these jobs of the future are. If we, do, if we don't have car manufacturing or automotive manufacturing, I don't sense that there is, apart from our primary industries, any, any investment really in, in what we're really good at. Yes, manufacturing cars is expensive in Australia, but that doesn't mean that um, we don't have the skills in height. I think, I mean, engineers particularly have amazing high-tech skills in Australia. We have amazing medical innovations. There are a whole bunch of things we're really good at. And we're doing well at and a lot exactly. of them. We're doing well at And that's where the investment yeah. needs to be. And, it's, and we have to create this culture as well of accepting a little bit of failure and, and having entrepreneurship and enterprising sort of... I mean, the young people in, in this country are amazing at that. But we need to see that vision as yeah. something that, that you're selling and saying in 30 years' time, that's what we yeah. want to be. We need a okay. set of well, can we, can we hear from the Minister yeah. as to what the vision is? The vision is to create employment, and we made that absolutely clear at the last election. That's not a... how, excuse me. How, how do you go about it? By having what we described as a diverse economy with five pillars, and don't dismiss agriculture, vitally important sector of our economy. <laughs> vitally Why important. Why did you just make the assumption that I dismissed agriculture? You said not just agriculture in your comments just then. But look, let's move on. Boeing, for example, <laughs> manufactures and employees. I think thousands yeah. in Australia making the wingtips for aeroplanes. And now, they developed the technology not a as well. single yeah. cent of government subsidy doing manufacturing yeah. in a high skilled area fantastically. I didn't know until the other day that we actually make buses in Australia. The chassis is imported, mm -hmm. the rest is made and fitted out in Australia, not one red cent of subsidy from the Australian taxpayer. It's because they're not subsidised, you don't get to hear about it. No, that, they no. are the strengths that we can work to, we should work to, and we as okay, a Eric Evetz, can I just uh, interrupt here with a question? Uh, Greg Combe, the former industry minister, now working to transform the South Australian car industry, has made a plea to the federal government um, you talk about no subsidies or no government involvement, so it's, a, it's an important question. His plea is that the future submarines program, a defence project worth tens of billions, should be allocated by this government uh, to an Australian manufacturer. What do you think? We will look at that exceptionally closely. Uh, when you have defence 
facilities, defence platforms, there are a number of issues that you need to take into account, uh, including uh, the uh, capacity of the nation to defend itself, so other considerations are at play there. And uh, where but would we you are... But would you like to see the future submarines being built in Australia? Look, I would love to see them built in Australia, as I would love to see a viable automotive sector in Australia. But at the end of the day, what we've got to do is play to our strengths. And if I might say, you know, that great agreement that Andrew Robb was able to negotiate with South Korea, most people were saying, what would that do to the automotive sector? Well, South Korea had an 8% tariff against Australian-made gearboxes and engines going to South Korea. Getting rid of that 8% tariff would have given us, does give us, extra access to their market in circumstances where we only had a 5% tariff. Okay, so see. trading off that tariff makes good sense for our manufacturing sector well, and, I dare I say it, yeah. getting rid of the carbon the tax yeah. will be a great help. I think for consumers it will be great to get rid of the 5%. Yeah. I think um, with, the, with the end of the Australian car industry, uh, we don't need a 5% tariff on car imports yeah. anymore. Um, we don't need um, bans on parallel importing. We, I mean, well, it's, a, it's a good revenue raiser mm. for the government. But, but you have to, presumably, think, presumably you, know, you would agree that mm. you have to keep them until this two or two oh, and a half year period. Oh, yes, mm. but then after that it should go right, because okay. it feeds no other there has been an argument raising. that they should go immediately. Oh, no, I don't think that's the case. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, Tony Burke. Uh, now, should the government get involved in creating jobs, uh, in, in creating jobs in the manufacturing area, for example, with defence industries, as Greg Combe suggests? Well, certainly manufacturing sites were the prop for almost every media conference day after day before the election. Uh, and there's not so many props being used uh, these days. The car industry funding needs to be understood exactly how Heather said. It is not simply, and has not historically simply been about the people who work for Toyota or Holden or Ford for that matter. Uh, it's about the components industry that employs many more people that works under it. And the full impact, we do not yet know, of how this is going to ricochet around related manufacturing areas. Uh, but we talk about all these components areas and we say, well, they don't get a cent of government funding. No, but they're reliant and connected to industries that were part of that. And I don't think the government has fully estimated exactly what the employment income is going to be, the employment impact is going to be of having no car industry here at all. As Mitsubishi or Ford or others had left, the components industry still had a critical mass to continue. The moment Holden went, components industry arguably had lost its critical mass and that no doubt would have been part of Toyota's decision. OK, just to bring you back to the question that I just asked you, your former industry minister says one way out of this is for the government itself to provide industries through its defence spending. That, that's the sort of thing that we did. We made decisions of that nature. This specific proposal I don't know enough about mm -hmm. to give you a, mm -hmm. a lockdown right it's, it's interesting. A number of com car components companies actually diversified away from yeah. just supplying to the automotive industry and actually supplied to the defence industry. Yeah. And that's particular in, in South Australia, so I can see where mm -hmm. Greg Combo's coming from. Do you have three points well, to make? <laughs> <laughs> or just one, perhaps? I don't really see it as a political thing. I mean, Ford yeah. left under Labor, the new car companies. If you are more expensive than than the EU, then you don't have a long-term future. And there's only so long that you can subsidize companies by giving them $20,000 a worker or whatever it works out, some huge amount of money. All, I, I mean, I think we do great things in Australia. I'm one of the people who moved here. I love Australia, and they do lots of great things. And I feel sorry for individuals when they lose their jobs. Who doesn't feel sorry for them? But, you know, there's always another side to the story. So when we have a high dollar, Heather sounds like this is awful, but, you know, Everything you buy as a consumer that comes from overseas is a lot cheaper with a high dollar. There's winners and losers on all of these issues, as, as any economist knows. And so these are tricky issues. And the idea that government's going to solve it with a super plan is ridiculous. I mean, you, you've, you set the framework, and you encourage people to go out there and work, and you hope that we're all flexible and we can change jobs through the course of our lives. Because you know, young people are not going to have one job through their whole lives. It's, it's very unlikely. Those days of starting with GM and finishing with GM, they're just gone. Actually, we've got a few people with their hands up there. We'll quickly go to that gentleman at the back there. Go ahead. The question I'd like to ask is one about vision. And I think every politician needs to have 
a vision or political party needs to have a vision. What we're talking about here is jobs. Where is the vision in relation to some of these things that we could do? Like, for instance, bringing water down through the centre of this country, which is a possibility. Where is the vision in terms of looking at, as the gentleman there mentioned, putting nuclear power stations which would reduce the cost of energy, make industry more efficient, and also provide a lot of jobs? Where is the vision? I would like, if I could, Tony and Eric to respond about the grand vision to put this country back to work. OK, well, we asked Eric Abetz about yeah. the vision before you get 30 seconds to uh, go because we've got a few other questions. Well, we had a water policy at the last election. Development of Northern Australia was part of our policy and plan as well. And the Prime Minister has indicated he wants to be remembered as the Infrastructure Prime Minister. So that's part and parcel of our plan in 30 seconds. And uh, Tony Burke, does Labor have a vision for recreating jobs? Needs to be jobs of the future. Needs to be jobs that are sustainable. And we need to make sure the competitive advantage for Australia isn't a low-wage nation. But the competitive advantage... I don't want to make sure that we look forward to future employment by having a, a low-wage, low-conditions workforce. I want to make sure that being the best educated workforce, <coughs> by investing in science and technology, <coughs> that we can actually get in front that way. OK, we've got a questioner right over that side. He's got his hand, his hand up very enthusiastically. I'll quickly go to you. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. I come back to the point that Heather made about skills and the jobs and thing. Those people who are going to lose their jobs in the car industry, they're going to join a big army of lots of unemployed people of all ages, people who've um, even taken the effort to study at university or TAFE, like myself, presumably to get the skills that employers want. But when we finish our study or whatever, we find that employers only want skills learnt in the workplace, not the classroom, making it seem like a waste of time. So we're stuck with the depressing catch-22 of needing a job to get experience, yet needing experience to get a job because employers simply refuse to train. OK, uh, I'll get Heather to respond to that. And, and... Uh, well, I can tell you, employers have been training a lot more than they used to. But as economic conditions get tighter, they'll train less. But I, I, can't, I can't advocate more strongly that in the coming budget, the worst place to cut would be in job... Um, training programs, supporting mature age workers make new transitions, lifting the skills base of the whole workforce. And literacy is a major area. It's a big problem in Australia in terms of the higher levels of literacy required in modern workplaces. So employers, yes, they have an they have a absolute a role in training. Individuals have a role in training to be receptive to it, to want to be involved in it. And, of course, government has a huge role in making the infrastructure available. We have a very messy training system in Australia. Where VET gets cut all the time. We've had... You know, it took us 10 years to get a national regulator and then one, one state wouldn't go into it and actually the, the headquarters is in that state. The regulator is under-resourced. Uh, there's a whole lot of host of issues. And it's very important also because we have a wonderful education industry in Australia, yet we've had, you know, bad practices in that. So I'm with you. And I, you know, I go back to the point I made. I will be, I'm a great supporter of immigration. I chaired the big population panel that Tony Burke had. But I would be very sad if we brought a lot of people into Australia in a few years' time because we've got skill shortages and we have a lot of capable people here. If they got their skills up and got the chance... Um, they should be employed in the... OK, James, want to get in on this? Well, Heather might be with you, but I'm not. Unemployment here is 6%. It's a credit to both, both sides of politics. You want an army of unemployed, go to France, where it's 11 or 12%, or Spain, where unemployment rate for young people is about 30%, or Greece, where it's about 50 There's no army of unemployed people in Australia. We have a pretty good job market. The labour laws need to be fixed a bit, but basically it's pretty good. So it's true that some people are unemployed. It's unfortunate. That 6%, of course, includes churn and people out of work for a while. But if you're a young person in Australia, your chances of getting a job are better than most other democratic countries in the world. Well, except for the fact that youth unemployment is uh, 15 to 20% in some areas and even higher in really some growing. areas. I mean, right. let me, because let you have to pay them $25 an hour for their first job. It's not worth a while. Actually, a lot I mean, of them are 20, whatever. Yeah. OK, we actually have a question from a young person who is trying to get a job. It's from Daniel Turner. Thanks, Tony. Um, and I totally disagree with what James just said, just putting it out there. Uh, my question is to Eric Betts. I'm currently on a disability 
support pension for various disabilities I have. I don't want to be on the DSP, I want, I'd much rather be in work and earning my own wage. I've applied for a number of jobs, but because of my disabilities, I'm limited to applying to only sit-down jobs or desk jobs. Could you uh, share, share more light on the government's plans for the review of the disability support pension, just to put me at ease, to know that I won't be, or my income won't be uh, totally pulled out from under me? Eric Abetz. Yeah. What the government has said is, and in general terms, what we need in this country is to ensure that the social services that we provide provide a safety net and not a hammock. And as a result, we do have to be careful to ensure that money goes to those that actually need it, deserve it and require it, rather than those who may think that uh, it's a lifestyle choice. Clearly in your circumstances uh, that you've outlined, the little that I've gleaned, clearly uh, you are a person that is aspirational, you are willing to work, you want to work, and uh, you, I hope as a result of this uh, program tonight, somebody might be out there saying, I'll give that bloke a job, and an opportunity, and that is what I would call on all employers to do, is to have a look at the opportunity to uh, assist uh, the disability community in our nation. A quick question just to follow up, Eric Abetz. You, you mentioned uh, a safety net, not a hammock. Now, how many of the people uh, who are on disability support pensions do you believe are in a hammock? I, I cannot uh, specify that, and that is why each and every case has to be determined on its merits and should be so determined. And uh, what I think, uh, however, if I might say with respect that there has been a huge growth and the questioner, I would definitely not categorise in this situation, but there has been a huge growth in the disability support pension in this nation uh, unrelated to uh, other socio-economic factors and so one would uh, have to ask why has there been this growth and I think in fairness to the Australian taxpayer it's not us that funds it as a government okay. it's our fellow Australians that fund right, it we're just gonna, and in uh, fairness just, we need robust we'll just quickly go back to our question because he put his hand back up yeah. go ahead yeah um, I just want uh, to know what on what basis do you say that there's been a, a growth unrelated to the socio-economic factor. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Right, the, the circumstances and the statistics that have been uh, put to me on many an occasion and to the government indicates that uh, the growth in the disability support pension um, is unrelated to the other factors that you might suspect would uh, see that change. And so what uh, regrettably happens is that uh, some people that are on on unemployment benefit are able to shift to the disability support pension in circumstances where uh, that may not necessarily be appropriate and the best use of Australian taxpayers money. So let's just remember whenever anybody is on welfare or indeed my salary is a parliamentarian, I'm very, very conscious of the fact that it is my fellow Australians paying the money for that particular benefit, and that is something we as a government need to keep front of mind whenever we analyse these payments. OK, normally I would go around to the rest of the panel. I'm told we're over time, so we'll have to leave it there. You did get a chance to talk to the Minister directly, and that's yeah. a good thing. Um, that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Heather Redout, Erica Betts, Yasmin Abdel-Majid, James Allen and Tony Burke. <laughs> Thank you. And there is uh, no need...
There is no need to wait until next Monday for your next Q&A. You can join us again on Thursday night for a Q&A special with the head of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde. She was a pioneer for women in corporations and politics. Now, Christine Lagarde is one of the most influential women in the world, and she's shaking up the global economy with her emphasis on environmental issues, economic equality and gender inclusion. But can Christine Lagarde really change the dry old IMF into a force for sustainable and fairer economic development. Join me at 9.30 on Thursday night when Christine Lagarde answers Australian questions on our global future. Until then, good night.